Hey everyone, welcome to this next Learn Live series. Uh, my name is Peter Detender, based out of Belgium and an Azure technical trainer here at Microsoft. And I'm joined today with um, one of my best colleagues, um, Unai. Unai, how are you today? Hello, Peter. I feel really excited. In my previous role as a CE, as a customer engineer, I helped many organizations migrate into Git, jumping from centralized to distributed systems. So I'm really happy to tell you all the cool things we can do with Git. Nice. What's your experience, Peter? Um, well, it's, I think about the same as you. So super excited about Git, using it as a source control system. And the interesting thing is that you already know, but for our audience, um, by the way, this is all live. So feel free to let us know in the chat um, where you're from, what's your experience with Git or any other source control. Um, maybe I would say share some interesting stories that you have about using Git in a good way, maybe some less. Um, positive way we can uh, always try to to answer your questions during the session. Um, but coming back to your question, Unai, so my first steps uh, with Git was about two years ago when I moved away from a TFS Team Foundation server into Azure DevOps. And honestly, I cannot imagine my, I would say, day-to-day -day coding infrastructure as code world without the super fancy tool called Git. <laughs> now for the audience again, um, once more welcome, I would say. Now, this is um, only the first session out of four that we have in the next coming weeks, where it's always the same time, exactly the same as you're joining right now, where in this first session, it's all about an introduction to Git. Now, depending a bit on your background, you might be completely unknown to Git, and that's perfectly fine, because then you're gonna already learn a lot um, right after the, the introduction uh, slides here. But maybe you already use Git, and you go like, well, maybe I don't really need to follow that introduction session. But nevertheless, we still want you here because again, it's all live. We're watching um, the messages here on chat. So if you got any questions, any stories you want to share, or why not maybe share um, like from what part in the world you are. Um, me and Unai are from Europe. So for us, it's like close to midnight, close to 11 o'clock here. Um, but as you can see, full of energy to um, just talk about Git and everything that you can do with it in the next um, 90 minutes. Now, if you want to follow along for the ones who are um, already experienced or watching the Learn Live, um, yeah, why not every week? Then you already know that it's all about learning, right? I mean, the platform is called Learn Live, which means you're going to learn a lot. That's really um, what we're here for. Now, if you want to follow along, feel free to do so where um, today's session is based on a module that's already available on the Learn platform, and you can connect to it from aka.ms, that's our Microsoft shortlink, slash learn dash git dash intro. And the link will change for the outstanding sessions, but more on that um, all the way at the end. Yeah, so as Peter is mentioning here, four modules. Today is the first one, introduction to Git. Next three will be collaborating with Git, so starting to see some few more advanced things on how to collaborate between teammates. That's the actual power that Git will be giving us. Jumping a little bit further into branching and merging with Git, that's going to be covered on May 10th. And finally, GitHub and Git. What's the difference? What do we use it for? What are the benefits from using both of them? Okay, that's what's going to be covering on the closing last session that will be on May 17th. Okay. Awesome. Um, by the way, so today it's it's me and Unai, and then next week it's going to be Unai with one of our other uh, cloud evangelists, Laurent. Next session will be um, Nitya and another cloud advocate, and then I'm coming back for the last session uh, together with John Papa. Now back to the, the learn. So once more, and again, we just want to emphasize making sure that you know where to find the information. If you want to follow along with some of the demos we're doing, the script on the demo exercise actually is also available within that learn module. So feel free to go to aka.ms slash learn dash git dash intro and feel free to follow along. Now, nothing would be learning if you don't really know like what are we going to do in the in the next 90 minutes, right? So quickly giving you some overview, we'll start with um, version control. Not even touching on Git from the, the first couple of minutes, but you already know it's going to, obviously it's going to be about Git. 
Now, before jumping in all the excitement about Git itself, we need to talk about version control to make sure that you have a really good understanding what version control is all about. And from there, we're going to move over to Git as one of the, the prime tools we're going to use in um, this series in the next four weeks. And then once you know about Git as the tooling, we're going to switch to um, a collection of demos, literally showing you live on screen how to get started really from the basics, validating your Git install, where we're going to use the Cloud Shell from the Azure portal. But technically, you'll find out that there's a lot of different ways to use it. And then once we have our Git um, environment up and running, that's where we're going to start creating some program folders, injecting some source code, and we start working with, um, I would say, some of the interesting and probably most important uh, Git comments for you to use. And then in the next session, we're going to switch over to some more advanced um, configuration, team collaboration, what I already mentioned. That's going to be the idea. So just as a reminder, as we see it here, it's going to be a basic introductory level to Git. Um, as we told you before, Peter, this is live and interactive. Please let us know what you think. Share your experience. Uh, any question you may have, just let us know. We'll try to answer it. Sounds good. And I think that's the probably the, the yeah, I would say the biggest excitement for me as well as the presenter that it's it is obviously being recorded, but we're live streaming on Learn Live here. If you're watching from Twitch, you're more than welcome as well to be here. If you're watching the show from YouTube, also again, more than welcome to be here. And you just need to switch to the Learn Live platform if you want to um, create some interaction. And again, it's um, on my second screen here. So when you see me watching to my other side here, it's not because I'm catching up on emails. It's literally because <laughs> I'm trying to um, yeah, look at some of the questions and make sure that during um, the time frame that we got allocated, your questions um, are actually getting answered. So what do you think, Gunai? Should we jump in and start? I think, yeah, I think we should get us started. So as we said, this is going to be an introductory level in learning experience for Git. Okay, Git is a version control system. There's many different version control systems. We'll be discussing that. Okay, and we'll see what is the actual power of Git. Okay, so Git can seem a little bit cryptic at, at first, but it can be also even frustrating at times. Okay, so we'll try to put the base here, like let us let you know what you should know, what's happening on the background, because what Peter and I will be sharing here, you may be doing it later on with some few different graphical user interfaces. But here we are going to be showing you the actual Git power from the command line. Okay, so seeing what's happening on the backbone. And especially because we are seeing that Git was quite famous already for software developers, but lately we are seeing it being used in many other IT profiles right now. Okay, so people working on configuration files, people working on infrastructure as code, file, people even working on documentation, they are using Git nowadays. Okay, so it's not just a tool for software developers. That's why we want to make sure everybody is onboarding correctly into this tool. Okay. Well, it's what I told you, right? Yeah. Tell me, uh, Peter, sorry. Well, no, it's what I told you. Like my own experience with Git was once I started looking into to like Azure DevOps. And yeah, my background is like building Microsoft data centers before Azure. It was all on-prem, uh, but obviously now been using Azure for quite some years. And yeah, that's what got me into to like the, the interesting DevOps world. And I can imagine it's the same for our audience and checking some feedback. So there's some yeah, some feedback like Git is complex. Um, some other ones are sending some information like I love Git and I couldn't live without it anymore. <laughs> and I guess it's about the same feeling as I have where, yeah, it's just becoming your day-to-day -day tool, almost like checking your phone every now and then where you're just going to use Git to check in your code and as you mentioned updating um, why not creating documentation creating ebooks creating blogs and anything else you can do with it but um back to you una yeah sure so peter and i will be showing you some demonstrations that are building up on an scenario okay so the scenario we are trying to imagine is that we are a software developer at a company this company decided to start working with git and in order to get us ramped up into it. We don't want to start working on the real project directly because we are going to make a lot of mistakes probably with Git. So what we are going to be building is actually a 
CAD website, okay? So a website where people are going to be able to upload cats. I was telling Peter before, I actually hate cats. I prefer dogs, but <laughs> this is the scenario that uh, the Learn product team decided to create for you. And that's the one we are going to be using today. Okay, so just creating a cat uploading, a picture uploading website and see how we can start initializing that repository. How can we set it up? How can we start tracking changes and making um, going back, going forward on those changes we are applying. Yeah. Well, I was actually more looking forward to the, like the aviation company website you were talking about, but for <laughs> me, cats is fine. Um, I do have a cat at home, so um, I had dogs before, and I'm, I'm not even really decided, like, am I more like a dog person or a cat person? Um, but I think for now, our demo scenarios, um, <laughs> using cats is obviously perfectly fine. But enough about cats and dogs, let's maybe talk a little bit about, um, yeah, one of our key statements in, in using um, Git, but taking a few steps before diving into Git itself and sharing some insights on version control. And that's really the magic word for today. Now, if you ask me, like, what is um, version control, you could think about um, your local file system. For the ones who are using Windows Client for a um, couple of years back already, um, you could integrate uh, versioning which means you're going to create some kind of file, could be a Word document, could be a PowerPoint file, could be almost anything else. And if you want, but as an end user, you needed to enable it, you could go back and enable version control. Now, it's obviously not exactly the same, but overall the concept would be pretty identical. So by using a version control system, sometimes abbreviated as a VCS, it allows you to track changes, Whenever you're going to make a change to a file, could be a small change in some application source code, could be a change in a PowerShell script, maybe an ARM template, Terraform template, or why not if you want to create documentation. Um, my own blog is written um, using Git as well, where whenever I'm blogging, but not always uh, publishing it already, I'm relying on Git to check in my changes and from there moving forward. So, super important even before jumping into um, all the nice things about Git, is really having that concept about version control. And it's going to make your life so much easier. Sorry, Peter. I was mm -hmm. just jumping into the Git documentation right now. Oh, cool. I'm quite surprised to see. So the actual main site for this is Git-SCM. Could you tell me what SCM stands for? Well, in my legacy data center days, I would immediately think about like system center configuration manager, <laughs> but that would be SCCM. So that's not what we're talking about here. Um, it's actually pretty cool what they did with URL. So you could assume that you would go to git.com, but what they actually did is like using um, version control and SCM, which by the way stands for software configuration management system. And you can use the two um, like interchangeable as well. So it's, or a version control system, a VCS, or it's also called a software configuration management system, SCM. And that's where I would say that little cool gimmick in the URL um, is coming from as well. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Good. Um, well, since you apparently you had some time to read the documentation website, right? Um, while I was presenting on what version control is, but could you maybe provide a summary on like what is version control? Why would you use it? What are some of the capabilities since you read the documentation anyway? Sure. So what I can tell you, I mean, one of the main focuses of Git is enabling collaboration. Okay, so for collaboration, what we need to know is when, who and what. When did the change happen? Where did it happen? Who did it? And what did they actually change? Okay, so that's something that we are going to be able to track with Git. Apart from that, we are going to be grouping changes on every operation called commit. Peter will be explaining it later. We'll have a message linked to it. And not only message, people were talking about DevOps before. So in DevOps, what we find super useful is the traceability of the changes you apply in code because they can actually break your code. Okay, So being able to link it to your uh, software planning tool. So I may have some bugs, I may have some tasks spending, are these changes linked to that one? Okay, so we can trace it back whenever something happened. 
Of course, being able to retrieve past versions. Okay, so going to the history, we may need to roll back our solution. And finally, of course, for collaborating, creating branches and all that, we'll be covering that mainly on session number three and applying tag to a versions. We'll see here that in the end, Git will be taking snapshots of your situation of your repo, okay? Some snapshots are gonna be more important than others. Maybe one of the snapshots is the actual version number two, version number three of our code, and you want to put a clear pointer to that snapshot. So that's something that Git tags will be actually providing us in the end. Sounds inter interesting, cool. interesting, right? <laughs> Yeah, I was just checking if there's some input coming in from our audience. Um, all good for now, so no <laughs> urgent questions coming in. Great. So apart from that, I mean, that's all the advantages that version control tools have, at specifically Git. Git is versatile, it's cross-platform, it's highly scalable, free and open source. Okay, and uh, just out of curiosity, it was created by the creator of Linux, okay, Linux Torvalds. Okay. Oh, okay, cool. I didn't even know that, but it actually helps a little bit in, in understanding, like, I had, like, quite some friends, like, years ago already using Git, but they were all, like, using Linux, where I was using my Windows machine, and honestly, I never heard about Git before, so <laughs> that could also explain why they started using it already years ago, when when I was still, like, in, in yeah, almost 100% Windows world. Now, one of the other things we need to talk about, I guess, is um, the version control. I know we started talking about version control, that you could use it to keep track of changes and some of the, the core capabilities that you mentioned. But there's another thing that um, I actually need to emphasize from the start to make sure that our audience know um, what we're talking about. And if you open up your search engine and if you're maybe not immediately going to Git, although again, yes, the session is obviously about Git, <laughs> but one of the other aspects is um, the difference between version control systems. Because what I explained before is that out of that VCS, the version control system, it's allowing you to um, keep track of changes, but not all changes are the same. And it also means that not all version control systems are the same. Now, when you start using version control today, and I would say probably using Git. If you enjoyed this session, I could only hope that you start using Git um, within the <laughs> next hour or so. But when we talk about Git, it's known as a distributed version control. Now, before drilling down on what a distributed version control system stands for, let me take a few steps back in time. You already know I come from the on-prem data center world, been working in IT for about 25 years, and for quite some time, at that moment in time, internet was still pretty new and working from home was like almost non-existent. I know for some younger ones in the audience, this might sound like, oh my God, that guy is so <laughs> old. Um, I, I still feel pretty young, but every now and then I feel pretty old as well. But what do we mean with um, a distributed version control and centralized version control? So at present, if you start onboarding to some version control system, preferably using Git, it is distributed. Now, before distributed, we were using a centralized version control system. And again, just sharing some of the um, examples like on-prem data centers, everybody was working from within the office where it just somehow made sense that you would share your files, your source control, your application code, your, um, I don't know, batch scripts, maybe somebody was using VB script already at that time um, and storing them centralized. Where obviously the, the benefit, the mindset also at that moment in time was that you would have one centralized system where all developers and maybe system engineers were all working together on the same files. Now, some of the challenges, but again, I'm talking a little bit of history here where we didn't know about anything better and some of the, the challenges was um, like a single point of failure because you would create your central database system. Think of it as like a SQL or Oracle alike database, but it wasn't really using those tools, depending a bit on, on uh, the systems or solutions you were using. But you had a centralized database where obviously no rocket science there, but if the database is not available, it means that you cannot touch your source code, which means 
you cannot make changes, you cannot deploy applications and anything that's blocking you from, I would say, working efficiently. The other one is also like really forcing you to have connectivity to that central system. And we had solutions like VPN allowing you to maybe work from home or from somewhere remote, but without that VPN connection to um, like the headquarter office, probably it was not even possible. So don't want to spend too much time on everything that's like not OK or maybe not anymore with a centralized system. And I see some feedback coming in from the audience like, oh, we're using centralized uh, version control in our organization. Are we doing it wrong? So definitely there's nothing really wrong with it, but I would say we're going to try to to yeah share some insights and getting you excited about the new way of working, which would be a distributed version control. So what is distributed? It's giving you all the benefits that we didn't have with the centralized one, where, for example, one of the, the first statements is that any developer or operations um, engineer, like what we would call DevOps engineers today, each and uh, every one of them that are part of that team or the project are able to create a full end-to-end -end full copy of all the source code to their local machine. So imagine, and we're going to show you um, not specifically today, although we're using um, the same backend environment, but throughout the, the four sessions, we literally going to build up from uh, this is like me just working on my local machine. And then in the next session, we're going to integrate with some of our team peers and sharing code, collaborating on uh, file changes. But we're not going to touch on that um, already today, but it's coming in the other three sessions. Now, what we're going to do with the distributed model is really like literally cloning, creating exact copies of all information. So I'm storing all the files if Unai um, would connect to my project out of the distributed VCS, he would get all the files as well. Obviously, the biggest benefit is that each and every member of the project will have a full copy, which also means you can work offline. And I know most probably for um, yeah, most, if not all of you on the call here today, you're going to probably work from home and you do have uh, a decent internet connection. But I remember not that long ago, like a bit more than a year ago, where before I was like traveling the world for the last seven, eight years. And you don't want to know when I'm not proud of it and I wouldn't really recommend it doing it, but you don't want to know how many like PowerShell scripts, ARM templates, even full web applications I've been coding while on a plane because it's not always that exciting, right? And then whenever I'm like arriving at my hotel or going to the customer site, I could immediately check in my code updating it, synchronizing it, and all my team members were immediately up to date as well. So the biggest benefit I would say is um, distributed model, each and every team member working on the same project, using the same uh, project folders, and we'll talk about some terminology in a minute. Um, we all have uh, the exact same copy. Next to that, we can also learn from each other. We can create um, some features like, oh, I got this cool idea, I'm going to inject it, but I'm not going to force all my colleagues to already accept it. And a lot of other cool things that we're going to show you later on um, in some demos. Sorry, so that's Peter. in short what, yeah, go ahead. So you were mentioning that I'm able to copy the repository. What about history? Because with centralized options, I was only able to see the history if I was connected to the repo. If I get mm -hmm. the full copy of the repository, as you are saying, am I going to be able to check the history when I'm offline too? Um, yeah, definitely. So again, the, whenever you're going to like check in connecting and we're going to use some specific terminology later on, it's allowing you to keep track of all the changes, validating all the history, maybe fixing some issues that you had before without everybody else already knowing about it. Great. That sounds interesting. That, now it makes sense why many customers were trying to ask me on helping them migrate into Git. <laughs> So great, let's jump then into the terminology, okay? We are gonna start um, reviewing main aspects related to Git. Um, we are gonna be doing that by jumping into a whiteboard, okay? So having some clear idea of how Git is working. So let me share the whiteboard with you. And here we are gonna be seeing, not moving that arrow, just coming back to this first place. 
that in Git we are going to have three main different states. Okay, the first one will be the working tree. Okay, so the working tree will be some file directory on your computer that Gil will start monitoring. Okay. I'm going to start changing some files. I'm going to start adding some files. From those changes that I may be applying, it will be quite interesting for me to define what are the changes that I want to include into the next possible change. So the next possible change will be grouped on what they call the staging area, also called the index in Git. Okay. And finally, we'll see what are the commands to move your changes from the working tree to the staging area, from the staging area to the repository. Okay, so the repository is the uh, main place for Git. Okay, so the repo will have the full history. Well, repository or repo, people normally call it repo it's as a shorter way. Okay, we'll see that the repo is that place that we are going to have with all the tracked changes, and we'll see later. Okay, how important it could be to. Um, so mainly talking that the repository is what travels from your computer to a server, from the server to those people that are going to be collaborating with you. But more about the insights related to Git, Peter, I heard a little bit about hashes, object types. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, sure. So, and I know it's it's a little bit about terminology, but Obviously, when whenever you want to learn something new, like getting introduced to Git, um, it's it's always easier to like grasp some of the the theoretical part and then mapping it with some demos that we uh, do have upcoming in the next couple of minutes. Now, the hashing is um, yeah some kind of checksum if you want that allows you to by well, you or or at least Git as the process allowing you to really identify the changes. So imagine you do have a file like some application source code or some template or anything else that you um, start creating. And in the back end for that specific file, it's creating a hash. Now, whenever you're going to make changes to the file and you're going to save them, quite important, never forget to save your changes. Whenever you're going to save your changes, that's validating out of the Git process, like, oh, something happened, something got changed, and it means that it needs to create a new hash. Now, it also means if you're um, like opening the file but not making any changes and just closing it again, then technically no change is happening. And that's where no new hash is getting created as well. Now for um, some technical questions, I just saw one coming in like, yeah, but um, like, can you share some details about the technical um, components of the hash? So just some information I will try to show you later on, but the hash itself is 160 bits long where the full hash is represented as like a 40 character long string. And I'm not sure if I'm the only one, but technically it's quite hard for me to remember like 40 characters. So without doing anything, um, anything more detailed, like checking log files, for example, um, Git is only exposing like seven characters. And that's somehow a little bit easier in communication. Great. Can I help a little bit, Unai? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense now. So apart from that, I think uh, we already mentioned there's different branching, okay, and that's the actual power of Git. Okay, we'll see that branches will let us group link commits, so people can be working in different versions of the same code. They are great for experimenting, as we can see it here. People will have independent environments. And what about the default branch? So some people have the default branch as main, some other people have it as master, and I think it makes a lot of sense for obvious reasons. We are transitioning to main as the name for the default branch. Okay. Important to mention also what we call head in lowercase letters and head in um, uppercase letters. Okay, so when we mention head, and we are going to be trying that with some few commands, head is the current commit we are showing for a branch. Okay, So we are going to be reverting. We are going to be going back to some few commits before. You can put head minus the number of the steps that we are going to be jumping back into. Okay. Also super important to mention, so here you see it, repository and remote. Okay. How multiple people are going to have the same repo, how we are going to be synchronizing between each other. 
will be done by defining for your repository what is the remote location, the remote path, where it has to be looking for updates. Can you tell us a little bit about it, Peter? What are the commands mainly used for this synchronization? Um, well, yeah, so there's um, a couple of different comments that we're going to use, but at least for now, in, in I would say getting started with Git, um, what two of the, the main comments you should try and remember is like Git push and Git pull. So what you're doing with Git push, like the name says, is literally pushing from your machine into the, the centralized uh, repository and Git pull allows you to like grab the latest files from the central um, repository and making sure that you're like completely up to date. And if you have um, like a, a fast changing project with a lot of collaboration with your uh, developers or your operations teams, and there's a lot of changes coming in, then what I'm personally doing is like running that Git pool, like maybe once or twice a week to make sure that everything that I'm having in my local copy is actually stored um, and fully in sync with um, everybody else on the project. So Git push, Git pull, that would be like, um, I would say two prime important comments to remember. And there might be another one that could be useful, but we'll talk about that more towards the end of the session. Uh, would be like Git reset, where you could, besides just using the main keywords, you could also use um, some specific parameters. And then later on, we're going to walk through like Git status or Git log, and then you can add some specific parameters to that one as well. So Git would always be the starting comment, and then adding like some task detail that you want to get out of it, like pushing, pulling, logging, uh, pulling up a status. And from there, you can define some specific parameters. Now, I can imagine that not all of you are waiting to just memorize and learn like Git comments by heart. And honestly, it's not really what we're doing. But again, um, yeah, in this introduction session, once more, I think it's important to know like how is the tooling actually working before we're going to integrate it in some other tooling. Now, as you can see here, there's Git integration with a lot of like traditional development environments. If you're using Visual Studio, if you're using um, Visual Studio Code, maybe you're using GitHub Desktop, um, it makes your life a lot easier. It means that you don't have to memorize all those comments. Now, one of the, the side remarks here is that out of the integration in your preferable um, ID environment, it's not always giving you all Git capabilities. So what it means is that every now and then, typically when you see some error message coming up from the tooling itself, that every now and then it's not always that clear. And that's where having that notion about the actual comments in the back of the tooling um, could be beneficial. And since we talked about GitHub um, and mentioning Git every now and then, I think it's um, yeah maybe interesting to to mention that it's not exactly the same. Now GitHub by itself is obviously based on Git, so it's that um, version control system distributed, allowing developers, operations teams to collaborate and check in changes, make changes, and working together. But the the version control part of GitHub is only like one subset of um, the actual capabilities. So what you can do with GitHub, and for the ones who are waiting um, for more details, we're not going to cover them in this session, but we have a lot more coming up um, around GitHub and a lot of other tools that integrate with the Git um, version control in session three and four. So you need to hold on for a couple of weeks, but looking forward to see you back already. Now, in short, what GitHub gives you besides version control is um, project management, allowing your team members to create issues, uh, starting up discussions, integrating um, GitHub actions, allowing you to run pipelines, pushing uh, specific deployments to cloud environments, to on-prem environments, overall performing some project management. So it's a lot more in GitHub than just using the version control of Git that we already talked about. Yeah, I think what we need to leave really clear is like Git and GitHub are completely different things. Okay, so GitHub is a place where you can host Git repositories. You are going to work with Git technology. GitHub will give you the server functionality to host them in their servers. Okay. 
Great, so I think it's time, Peter, to jump into the first demo then. Are you ready Why for not? this one? Um, let's hope so. Let's see if we can do a little bit of magic here and switch over to my screen. Great. And for the ones who are uh, following along, feel free to uh, just have a look at that learn module. So if you missed that link, it's aka.ms. Uh, learn, git, intro, and dashes in between the keywords. And if you start up the exercise from there, what it gives you is Cloud Shell. Now, it might be a little bit confusing at first, but Cloud Shell is just our way of giving you access in an easy way to using Git. Now, you don't need the Azure Cloud Shell to use Git, but it's just out of the Learn module. If you don't have um, a machine that you can use or you don't want to use your uh, corporate machine or maybe your personal device, because maybe you're not 100% convinced about Git yet, um, out of yeah, using that Azure Cloud Shell, it's a command line based, um, browser based integration, so you don't need to in install anything locally. And it's just going to make your um, experience out of the Learn module so much easier. So I'm just going to follow along and showing you what it looks like. So once you're authenticated, you get access to a Bash environment. If you don't like Bash, you can switch to PowerShell, but for Git, it doesn't matter. The experience is the same. On your local machine, in um, Another scenario, if you're not using Cloud Shell, you can go to that Git SCM website, download the version for your platform, Mac OS, Windows, Linux. You install um, the tooling, and from there, you're going to start validating. So one of the, the first comments that could be interesting is just running Git or why not checking Git version. Think back about my push-pull example. I um, already briefly touched on it. So one of the, the easiest ways to validate it's just running Git, but that's just going to give you like some feedback. And why not checking the version? Now, based on what um, Unai was reading in the documentation, um, I somehow discovered that we have, in in meantime at least, the, the most up-to-date version would be uh, 2.31. So why the Cloud Shell is running behind a little bit, um, honestly, I have no idea, but it's not going to block you from using all capabilities from Git. If you want to update it, um, just keep in mind that within the Cloud Shell, you don't have the admin permissions to actually um, install it or update it at least. But you don't need to really worry about it. It's already pre-baked out of that Cloud Shell. Now, from here, let's check back what we have and to not mess up our files too much. I already created um, an application folder. And since we're in version one today, let's go all this way and well, now you talked about creating a cat website, so let's yeah. create a new folder and super original. We're going to call this one um, cats. Now, before using Git, one of the um, other interesting things we need to do is defining who we are. Now, there's no real um, authentication. It's not because I'm authenticated into the cloud shell that Git automatically knows who I am. So what we're going to do is using another Git comment would be Git config, like creating writing some configuration, and we're going to use global. Now, if you check in the documentation, you're going to find there's three different levels. You got systems specifically for um, your local machine, or in this case, the, the Cloud Shell environment. Global is, I'm going to make this valid for this repository, and you could also define um, git config local, and that's going to be specific for one single repository. We're next, that we looks need super to interesting, Peter, right? So if in, from the same computer, I have some repos for working on with my company and the other ones for some personal projects, that could be really useful. Yeah, for example, why not? So we're going to identify who we are. Um, we are the user Learn TV Git. Oh, that should be good enough, I guess. And if you do have some um, options to send email, you can add your email address, and then I just need to update my parameter where it's not username, but it's going to be user email. There we go. And then validating is always a good thing. So we can do get config once more and reading out information. So if I want, I could now go back and do get config local and using my own name. And that's not working yet, 
because we didn't initialize the repository. So what we did up till now is defining overall Git information, like I'm going to identify myself as being the Learn TV user, just to show you um, how you can switch from like one identity to another and linking it to your overall Git tooling or using it specifically for um, your repository. Now talking about the repository, let me clear my screen a little bit and check back and I already created that cats folder. So that's going to be my um, application source folder. Now once I'm here, I'm going to initialize this as being a Git repo and not going to make it harder as it should be, but it's really as easy as running Git in it. Now depending a bit on the version, it's um, could be a little bit more complex where it's not just accepting Git in it anymore. And it would require you to add um, Git in it, initializing with the name of the branch, where in the older versions, like the ones I'm using here in Cloud Shell, I could actually create my own branch and that would be Git in it, adding um, minus B for the parameter. And there seems to be a standard to use the main as when I explained on the whiteboard. And I think that's about it, but it doesn't seem to like it. Did I make a typo? Get in it. Maybe double piece. No, I think it needs to be git checkout uh, minus b. Maybe. Oh, that's right. Which one was it? OK. Yeah, it depends on the version, as Peter is saying. If you want to call your we go. branch main, it depends a little bit those first commands. And then eventually here it's telling me like switch to a new branch main. And remember some of the other comments we briefly touched on would be get status. And that's going to show you like there's no commits yet. We didn't create anything. We just initialized the folder. And we are using um, the main branch. As you can see, it's highlighted in red, which means there's something new, but there's no changes yet. And the other thing we have, and this should be super um, familiar for like Linux or Mac OS, but on Windows, it's um, just working in a slightly different way. So if you want to pull up like the hidden folders, we have obviously the root of our project. And more important for the topic we're talking about is that .git folder. That's what Unai was um, talking about on the whiteboard. That's what we call the repository. And I think that's about it for now. Yeah, I think that's about it. I mean, in the end, the .git folder will be telling us, we'll be keeping the insights from the snapshots and all these different internal Git related stuff that will be happening on your repo. OK, so cool. let me take it back. We'll jump back into the PowerPoint. So uh, Peter has been covering how to configure Git, setting up the repository with this global configuration, local ones that we can define. And finally, also we'll see how we can use the Git uh, minus minus help in order to get some more information from all the possible commands that are available, even if you are going to be using mainly four of them on your day to day basics. Okay. So what do you think, Peter? Should we jump into the first known list check? Um, yeah, let's do that. And then we could spend some time um, checking back if there is any question coming in from our um, our audience. So. Yeah, I think we if have one have... of the questions that will be covered uh, right after on the next session. So I'm going to leave it for later. OK, cool. So the first question we have here is which is the, of the following scenarios? It's a common use case for version control systems. Deleting earlier versions of a project file, so you know you are working only on the most current file or data. That's option A. Option B will be making experimental changes to your project in an isolated branch. And C, gathering feature requirements for a large project and communicating them to the stakeholders. What's your opinion, Peter? Which one do you think would be the correct one? Um. Well, like always on for the ones who are taking Microsoft exams, there's always like multiple choice and then a lot of the options are somehow similar, so it's always a little bit confusing. Um, let's see. Deleting earlier versions. Yeah, why not? I mean, it's it's yeah, probably what we're all been doing for so long. 
Um, making experimental changes sounds interesting, where I'm not really, I would say, the best coder. So I'm not always that proud of the like the, the, the coding I'm writing. So it might be useful for at least myself to experiment with it a little bit. And before I'm like 100% convinced that it's actually useful. Um, yeah, but then option C is also an interesting one, like gathering feature requirements, um, communicating with stakeholders, like sending some updates, knowing who they are. Uh, yeah, why not? Um, you need to Let's help see. me, Gunai. I have no idea. I think we gave enough time, so let's go for the answer. And this time, answer will be option number B. Okay, we said that it is mainly for experimenting and collaboration. Second one. So the second question would be, what is another name for a version control system VSC, BCS, sorry. Okay, version management software, VMS, software control management, SCM system, Software Configuration Management, SCM System. And I think, Peter, I was asking you something similar when we were talking about Git documentation, right? If I don't remember wrong. Yeah, I know we joked about it a little bit, but there's nothing more important than remembering jokes. Now, before checking back on like the answers for this one, um, we had a 100% correct answer for um, the previous question. So let's see what our audience um, is coming back with. Um, we don't have anyone going for the first one, so nobody's going for option A. I think and that's we have obvious, about yeah. yeah, we have about 50 50 for B and C. So okay, so let's see. It's, yeah, it's still changing a little bit, so we might give it another couple of seconds before oh uh, we expose it. Cool. Let's check back. Oh, there was a small change in, in the numbering, but most of the attendees actually are paying pretty Work good correct, attention, yeah. so thanks for that. And they went for answer C as the correct one. So good job for all of you. For the ones who um, didn't pick option C, obviously there's nothing wrong. You're all here to learn. So I would say pay a little bit more attention for what's still coming in the next 45 minutes and making sure that you are still enjoying the session, similar to what we're doing. Yeah, great. So let's be jumping then to the basic Git commands. Okay, start working with it, and that's going to be related to the, one of the questions that popped up in our windows. Okay, it's talking a little bit about it's staging the same thing as Git adding and all that. We are going to be covering that uh, right now. Okay, so basic Git commands. We told you before, if you run Git minus minus help, you're going to see a huge amount of commands. But in the end, you are mainly going to be working with these four main commands that we see up here, git add, git commit, git push, pull, and some few useful ones that some graphical user interfaces will let us see that information in a nicer way, but the status log and help that will be super useful. So let's jump into the whiteboard and see what they actually do. Okay. So jumping into the whiteboard, first one that we have will be the git add-in okay, command. And that's the one that happens right here. So this one is useful for answering the first question we had. Okay, it's git adding, same as staging. It actually is because it will tell us what are the files that has been modified, and you want to move them into the staging area. What about commit, Peter? Yeah, so commit is like the, I would say the the name stands for where you're literally committing, like confirming changes. Now, commit is actually like twofold, where it could refer to using the git comment, like I'm going to commit something, where I would tell you like, hey, Unai, um, I'm going to um, send you some updates, so first I'm going to commit it. So that would mean like initiating the, the git comment uh, commit action. But it's also like the noun, where the commit is literally um, forcing making changes to, um, yeah, to your source code and confirming, sharing them with your peers and confirming that everything should be up and running. Yeah, apart from those ones, so we have we also have the ones for push and pulling that uh, Peter uh, mentioned before, so synchronizing with a remote repository. Um, from the ones that we were mentioning on the slides, we see here 
One of them is the Git status. We'll see it in the demo. It's super useful. It will give us, as an output, the information about which are the changes you have on the working tree. Did you move them to the staging area? So what is the actual situation you have right now before jumping into doing a commit? OK. What about Git log, Peter? Can you remind us? Can you tell us what uh, it is? Yeah, Git log. So that's where um, you can literally pull up like logging information. Remember, I talked about the hash before. So if you want to find out like um, some more details about the hashing, that would be one of the, the comments to provide you some insights. It also allowing you to keep track of like um, who made the change. Remember, we ran that Git config username, user email. So if you want to find out like who committed that change, it's going to show you the commit um, ID, like the hash, also showing you the timestamp, like when did that change happen? Um, and I would say, yeah, super useful comment. You're going to use it um, in real life quite a lot. But the other interesting thing, Unai, that I find out um, like two slides back is where in the end, again, we started where Git is like super powerful and you're going to use it, giving you a lot of capabilities. But in reality, you just need to memorize like seven comments and you get basically like 90% of the functionality. That's pretty mind blowing. Yeah, and actually, would you mind to get luck? Uh, I have to say, Peter, I've seen some customers doing super interesting things. So the history mm -hmm. that is being shown gives us a lot of information about changes when they happen, what has been modified. So I've seen people even using it to automatically create documentation. So you see there's some few interesting, interesting stuff one. people are doing in the community. OK, so just the last one we have to talk about here is Git help. OK, so same as many other command line tools in the end. With the help parameter, you're going to be able to see and understand a little bit better information. That's about the one I'm using command. most. I think so. I, I think so. I'm <laughs> either jumping to help or just jumping into the documentation myself. <laughs> Great, so let's try it and let's try to follow with the demo here just remembering we are building the scenario of working with this cats website so peter worked before on initializing the git repository now we are going to be jumping and staging our first file making our first commit modifying a little bit the file seeing with the greatest git status command how everything is going um let's start making some few commits here okay sounds good and so i'll check back for some more questions coming in from the audience. Um, if you were joining in a little bit late, um, know that this session is live, which means you can answer, um, get your questions answered. So please keep them coming while Unai is switching to the demo environment. I'm watching the screen if you got any questions, concerns. And remember, it's part of the Learn module, aka.ms, Learn Git Intro. Great, so I'm going to restart the cloud shell for me because it gets frozen after some time. Jump into that folder we have right now. Let me just try to remember it. So there is learned git live repos. See the uh, first session if I'm not wrong. Let's see. Git session and the cats folder. So we are located back on our repository. Okay, I'm gonna clear it to make it a little bit nicer. And let's start by playing with it a little bit. So the first command that I'm gonna be running here is nothing Git related, will be the Git touch index. It's just a Linux based command that will create that file and or modify the um, metadata for the modified date. Okay, so I'm just creating an index HTML file right here. Okay, if I go now and we try for the first time Git status, you're going to be able to see that we have some untracked files. Okay, untracked files will be the ones on the working directory. It's telling me, hey, you know, you have an index HTML file created, but you didn't git add for it yet. You didn't move it into the staging area yet. Okay, so let's do that with the git add and the dot. In this case, I'm not selecting individual files. I'm selecting all of them. Okay, so adding it will move it to the staging situation. So I can run again the Git status and we'll see that now the output is a little bit different. What actually happened here, so we see some few more files is the, in the first command that Peter was running. Uh, there's some main files, uh, main branch related files that have been created. Okay, but let's just 
hold on to the index HTML one for now, <laughs> just to make it simpler. So the index one, together with all the rest, have been moved into the stage situation right here. Okay, so I think we are ready to create our first commit. And how do we do that? By running the git commit um, command right here, okay? Telling it that we want to create a commit for the index HTML file and with the minus M, what is the message related to these changes, okay? So if we run it right here, it was successful. One file has been changed, zero insertions, zero del deletions. Why? Because this file is completely new. We'll see some changes happening here when we are modifying an existing file on our case. Okay, so we can jump into another git command that we've been talking about on the whiteboard. Running the git log. Peter was saying it will tell us the history. Okay, we just have one commit. This is the hash Peter was talking about, right? Peter, if I'm not wrong, this weird identifier. Yep, that's the hash, but you only need to memorize the first seven characters. Oh, that's interesting. Because I'm really <laughs> bad remembering names. I cannot imagine numbers. <laughs> and here we have also the pointer to tell us like, hey, the head is pointing to this commit. This is where we are actually uh, located right now. Okay. So let's try to modify the index file again. Okay. And in the cloud shell, if you click on code and the file, it opens an editor quite similar to Visual Studio Code where we can modify our file, okay? In my case, I'm just gonna modify and put just some HTML property right here, pretty simple one, save our fel feline friends. I'm gonna just close it, I did the change for it and I saved it. And let's check the Git status again. So with the Git status, we see, hey Unai, you have modified the index file and you didn't stage it yet. Add it again. I'm not going to be adding it now, and that maybe is a surprise for some people, okay? Uh, but it's not maybe for others, because maybe somebody was kind of asking us, like, hey, Unai, I've been able to do commits directly without, without realizing there was an staging area in between. And that was my situation when I first started with Git. Okay, so that's what happens when you run git commit minus A. Okay, it jumps directly from, from the working tree to the hidden uh, to the index HTML file. Okay, so it jumps directly from working tree to repository without going through that middle stage. So that will create a new commit and we'll see right now that if we go again to the git log, this time we have two commits right here. Okay. So we can actually see that we created to git commits during this demo. Okay. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, right, Peter. Should we run an only check to see if everybody got it correctly? Um, yeah, just doing a little time check. Um, I think it might be better to move on and then mm -hmm. doing maybe some other demos um, to just show them. I'm pretty sure that most of you are following along, so it's just validating some of the yeah the steps we did in the demos. If you still know what we're doing, but we might speed it up a little bit for um like the yeah the last part of the session. We got about 30 minutes left and still got some other things that we want to show you. So maybe let's move on, Unai, and skip some of the questions for now. Sure, and we can come later if we have time. Then if we do have time. Why not? Perfect. Quickly checking if there's. Um, any question from the audience? You were going to answer that one question, right? Like, um, how can we undo any um, any ads? So you added a file, but can we also undo that? And if you force the commit, how we can undo that? So we might try and show some of that in our outstanding demos. I think we are actually covering um, some of that. I think we are actually covering when we talk about fixing uh, mistakes with Git. So how we can revert back, how we can reset it. So those questions will be answered on the end of the session, on the last part cool. of the session. Great. So with that, uh, let's leave the only check for later if we have time and jump into the next demo. So following with the same demo right here. Okay. 
So let me jump back into the Cloud Shell. And right here, we are going to be working again with the index HTML file. So I'm going to open it again in code. And I'm going to be adding some few extra lines right here. Okay. So if we modify some lines right here, save it, close it again. And let's run the git diff command. Okay. This is a new one that we didn't talk about, but we want to share it here on the demo too. So here you are going to be able to see, hey, what was the line that I used to have? With your change, what are the lines you are adding? Okay, so the, what's the difference between the state the repository had to the one that you are introducing right now? Okay. And you'll see that many tools like Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code will give us this functionality in an easier way without using command line and so, okay? But that's how it works on the background. So let's try to create another commit right here. I'm gonna quit that one, clear it again to make it a little bit nicer and run a commit for those recent changes that I just did to the index file. So now we can see it. One file has been changed, I didn't add it. I was deleting one line. 12 lines have been inserted. Okay, so you see that this one looks a little bit different, right, Peter? Oh, so it's not just keeping track of like the whole file change, but literally like everything you changed within the file itself? Yeah. Pretty nice. And if we run the git diff right now, so let's just run it again. This time we are going to see that, hey, your working tree and the actual repo, they have the same state. There's no difference on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the head in the working tree and the head in the repository are actually aligned. Okay. What else could be interesting here? And I think this one, this next command will be quite useful to the issue we had from the beginning of the repo. Okay, so if we just look for all the directory, we see that there's some main folder right here. Okay. And Git has some kind of functionality, which is the .gitignore file, which is quite useful because we can specify what are the folders and so that we may want to ignore. Because I want to ignore the main, main folder. I may want to ignore also some temporary files and so. So depending on the editor you are using in Linux, some temporary files will be created. Some .back files will be created. So this is mainly the place where you are going to say, hey, these are local files. I don't want to be synchronizing them in the repository. Okay. So that could be your like personal files if you want to keep track of some of the, I don't know, your personal documentation, but you want to, you don't want to integrate them um, as part of the repo. Some files you don't want to share with your colleagues because they're not really part of the project. And excluding them from the Git sync, that's really what you're doing here. Or imagine if you're a software developer the outputs from your compilation, we, you don't want to be sharing them with the rest of people because you're going to do that with the DevOps tool. So let's ignore those local files that are being created whenever you are running uh, building commands on Visual Studio. And so, okay, so that could be really useful too. So if we, I think I saved it. Yes, I'm going to close the editor for this one. Let's run the two commands that we need, git add in all and the commit again. Okay, so ignoring editor backups. That's the message that I'm including for this one. Okay, so one file has been changed. Three assertions, the three lines that I've been uh, creating right here. Okay. So let's keep on improving our demo, right? Because we only have an HTML file. What about the style, Peter? Maybe we should create some CSS files right here, right? Yeah, go ahead. You're doing awesome and looks like the <laughs> audience loves it. Um, by the way, could you do a little shout out to Kingston? She's one of the Learn Live fans, apparently. So, hey, Perfect. Kingston, thank you hey, for Kingston. joining us once more. <laughs> Hope to see you in four weeks from now for me and Unai next week as well. Yeah, I'm going to be watching for you next week. I'm going to be waiting <laughs> for you. So, I just created another folder. And as you see, if I run Git status right now, surprise, I created a folder. Git is not tracking it. Okay, so. Git track files. It doesn't track folders. 
Okay, so that's something that is quite interesting and it may surprise you in the beginning. Okay, so that's something that we need to be aware of. Now what I'm going to be doing is I'm just going to be creating some simple uh, style file. Okay, so just creating a git keep file right here and moving it into the staging area. So I'm creating a style file and moving it into the staging area with the git add command. Okay. If we run now git status, sorry. So we can see that a new file has been created right here. It tracks the file. It didn't track the folder when it was empty. Okay. But I don't really want this file. Okay, I want a style file. So I'm just gonna mm -hmm. remove it right now. It was just an example to show you how the git status will be able to track it. Okay, so this just remove that one and really create the one we need. So we need to create the site.css file and I'm going to open code for modifying it. Here, I want to be adding some few lines to define the style of my solution. Okay. Opening code, saving those changes, closing the editor. And let's see. Because I want to be modifying the index file too again. I'm going to be adding some few things on that one. I have to jump back to the previous folder, to the root folder where the index file is. Opening the index, I'm going to be adding after the title some other element on my HTML file to make sure that it's using this new style file that I'm using right here. So with all of that, I think I'm ready for creating a new commit right here. So let's run again the git add dot and the commit. We'll see that now the history became a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Right, Peter? It should have become longer. And maybe it's not that easy to that. understand it right, right now, right? Imagine we've been working, Peter, for a few days right here, opening the git log, and getting so many messages, it could be a little bit uh, difficult. Overwhelming. To find. <laughs> yeah, overwhelming and difficult to track, right? So for making this information come a little bit shorter, we can use the git log minus minus or dash dash one line. Okay. Mm. So you see that now it's it's much easier to read, right, Peter? And as you were saying, I think you were mentioning this one, right? I just need to remember the first seven characters of this identifier. Yeah, because I mean, like before, we we briefly touched on it. Where, well, it's always interesting to like know the comments, but you don't really need to memorize them, depending on the tooling you're using. But like in in Visual Studio VS Code, even in other um, DevOps tools like Jenkins, Team City, and whatnot, um, you're gonna see that they're all keeping track of all those commit changes. But if you're not using any of those tools, nothing would technically, um, yeah, block you from just telling like your colleagues like hey unai i just committed um change 6 ef and then you could immediately check the git log and finding out like oh peter made a change and adding some um css style sheet because that's the reference to the hash that um i mentioned you great that looks super interesting so let's go back to the slides so here we've been starting to modify the index creating subdirectories Reminder, it doesn't track directories. It tracks only files right here, right, Peter? Mm -hmm. Yep. Re so, no, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no worries. So, yeah, it's it's yeah tracking the changes. So, in short, what we did in in this demo is starting from that uh, folder, creating uh, the cats directory in the previous demos creating that index HTML, making some changes, adding the CSS file, replacing files, listing commits, validating the logs. That's um, everything we did for now. But up till now, everything worked out pretty well. But I can imagine, and if I look back on some of the feedback, um, yeah, it, it's not always that easy, right? Like every now and then something can go wrong. So why not spending some time talking about like how can we like revert what I call the oops admin, where you did something, you were like, oops, sorry, made a mistake. And maybe um, 
sharing in the last 15, 20 minutes we have, like how we can um, fix some of those changes. Sure. And I mean, in the end, anything can go wrong, right? We're using technology, we're using maybe some, um, I would say unfamiliar tool, although I hope out of um, this session that the ones in the audience are becoming a bit more familiar with Git. And again, if you've already been using Git for a while, um, feel free to share some feedback in the chat box as well. But no matter how long you're going to use it, even earlier today, um, in, in one of our internal Teams channels, um, I saw a message coming up like, oh, I made a mistake just by firing off the wrong Git comment. And I mean, it all happens, right? You might be super experienced. You might be totally new to the tool. And in the end, we all know that at some moment in time, something will go wrong. Now, the good news is that Git is there to help you from the start, uh, giving you a lot of capabilities, and at the same time, also allowing you to um, go through some easy fixes. So a couple of scenarios, and Unai is going to close with that in, in a demo, but for example, imagine that um, you made a change in your file, but it's not like a that important change because you just made a typo. Like when Unai was injecting that link to the, the style sheet, and it could just be a typo, like it's the file is not called like site.css, but we typed in like site.cs and just missing like one character. You could go through the file, make the changes, committing the changes, um, creating a new update, but maybe you just want to make that update without like creating a new commit. So one of the, the small mistakes you made are like a typo in your code. You could easily like hide that update um, and reusing the commit using the um, dash dash amend flag. So that's going to allow you to like update the change you made, but actually using the previous commit as the um, yeah the argumentation for that. Or you could also extend it and adding another parameter where you're going to add the no edit. And that would also help you to um, amend the change. So it's allowing you to update that, for example, index HTML file we're using and updating the path. Well, now you're going to run git commit, and Unai will show you that in a demo in the next couple of minutes. Git commit, add the amend setting and the no edit parameter, where the um, dash dash amend option is committing the change, but using it as like changing history. And how cool would it be if you could actually go back in time, like maybe back to the future, or just going back in time and pretending like nothing really happened, you didn't make any mistakes, and the file is still up to date. So that's definitely um, one other convenient command, I would say, that allows you to make some changes without um, committing a new change. And talking about changes, um, we already touched on like the, the cool thing about Git and using that for um, history. So what you can do is literally changing history. And I know it sounds weird, but it's it's super useful. You're going to find out that Whenever you start creating documentation, updating template files, or updating full um, application source code, that every now and then you're going to make some mistake, little oops, something happened, <laughs> and I'm just quickly going to fix it. And I don't need to do like a new git add, make the changes, new git commit, and you can just um, revert history a little bit. That would be the, I would say, the, the main message. Or, yeah, I would also add here that. We have to be really careful. Like history in GitHub can be changed, and it actually needed sometimes. So imagine that I'm introducing some sensible data on a on a file. Even if I delete it from the actual file, we have it on the history. People can go back to it and check that information. So treat it really carefully. But we are, it's actually a super powerful tool, and we'll see it right here. So one of the commands is using the checkout for recovering a deleted file. Okay, so if you Deleted the file from the working tree. Remember, we have the index and the repo. By using git checkout, you're going to be able to come back to the state the index was having. Okay, so that's a way of easily recovering a recently deleted file. Okay, that's because we only deleted it on the working tree. What happens if we delete it also and we let git know that it has been deleted? Then the checkout wouldn't work because it has been modified from the working tree and it has been modified from the index. We'll need to use other two commands that we are going to be mentioning right now, reset and 
recover, uh, sorry, revert. So reset and revert. So reset will be that one that will give us the option to take changes coming from a repo. Okay, but we'll see it here that resetting is actually something that will modify the history. So we have to be really careful with this one right here. And I'll try to open the whiteboard later to show you the main difference between revert and reset. Reset, you go back to a commit and the ones that you left there hanging are going to be deleted in the future. Okay. That could be tricky as well, right? It can be really tricky, especially when we work with remote repositories and so. The other one, maybe a little bit uh, easier to use, maybe. We'll see it later on this whiteboard. Reverting, what it's doing is not deleting some few commits we have in history. What it's doing is, as the name says, do the opposite as a specific commit we are specifying. Okay. Right, Peter? Do you want to jump into the whiteboard maybe to let's see this difference between the two of them and you can explain it maybe here in a graphical way. So, um, yeah, just go ahead, I would say. It's your whiteboard, so just go through. I'm just going to okay. check if there's any last questions coming in. Perfect. So from what we've been explaining, reset. So this is the one that is missing right here. Reset head minus one will take our repository to the previous commit. This one will be deleted in the future. Compared to revert, which is the second option we see right here. If I say git revert head minus two, we are going to be adding an extra commit that will undo what we did in this one right here. Okay, so you see here the difference between resetting and reverting. Very cool. Great. So maybe we can try quickly the last demo we have for this session. Let's jump into the same environment we've been using up to now. Clear it. And let's imagine that what we were mentioning before, I'm going to be removing the index file. If I remove it so you can see, I don't have index file anymore. Okay. I just see the CSS and the main folder. What if I do the checkout? This way of recovering what we had in the index, so recovering that file. So right now, I, back, I get back the index file. Okay, so you see it, nice. super useful right here. Compared to the other situation, what happens if I remove the index file, but I'm telling Git that I'm removing it? Okay, then the checkout won't work. Okay, if I try the checkout right now, I get an error message. I don't have it in the working tree. I don't have it on the yeah. index because I let Git know, right, Peter? Makes sense. So that's when reset comes to rescue. We'll tell the repository, hey, reset the head and get the index file from it. Because we know the head that was the last commit has the index file. So we can come back to that. Okay. It will appear as an unstage change. So if we check it out right now, so it, it's like it moves it to the index. And from mm -hmm. the index, we have to move it back to the working tree. So that's what we can do with the checkout, as we said before. And that will give me back the index file on the working tree that I have. Cool, right? I love it, man. I love it. So I think that's pretty useful in terms of uh, demos. Should we be jumping to the maybe the last and only check and from there to the end of the session? Yeah, so a quick time check looks good to me. Well, I think it's probably a good time to like wrap it up a little bit. And I would say to our audience, um, congrats, you somehow made it through this first session. Uh, we're not 100% finished yet, but just want to close in, in a nice way. Um, and just quickly going back to um, like 90 minutes back in time, we talked about Git history. So let's take a couple of steps back into our own session history as well. So in short, um, what we talked about is learning. Um, yeah, what is Git? 
the, the uh, distributed version control system where next to that we walk you through like how to configure it from the start um, using a lot of different Git commands where eventually I was super excited that you only need to memorize like seven of them to do actually a lot of really cool stuff. So we started with configuring Git, checking the Git version or installing it on your local machine, showed you how to create um, repositories where you're going to initialize your Git. From there, once it's initialized, you could um, yeah, track the changes and then updating files, validating the files, committing the changes, and whenever something went wrong, like making minor oops admin little mistakes, how to recover from them. And we briefly touched on the differences between um, Git and GitHub as well. Now, at this point, I would say you should know enough about Git, like where to find it, where to find the documentation, um, and get started. You could create your own little basic project. We're going to continue building up on our little cat um, cat based website, but don't let it hold you back. I would say in the next couple of days and then hopefully see you back next week. Now, if you're um, interested in learning more again, remember that um, this was only the introduction and you can follow along on that learn life module. So if maybe some of the demos were a little bit too fast, if um, some of the explanations were not 100% clear. I would recommend you to go back to the learn website, aka.ms slash learn git intro and dashes in the middle. That's where you're going to find the exact module that we used for the explanations where you can follow along going through the exercises again, similar to what we did in the demo environment. Most important message is coming up where again this was only introduction to get setting the scene warming up a little bit for everything that's coming in the next three weeks the exact same hour the exact same day may 3rd may 10th and closing that will be me again with john papa on may 17th where we're going to talk about collaboration that's unai and laura next week from there we're going to move up making it even more exciting about um, collaboration using get branching where multiple DevOps engineers are working together and eventually merging, bringing all the changes um, together in the main branch. And then I'm going to highlight some interesting um, updates, capabilities using Git as part of GitHub and at the same time sharing some insights on other GitHub capabilities. So with that, we're, I think, perfectly on time to Check back if there's any questions outstanding from the audience. Everything looks good from here. We answered all the questions that came in. So with that, I would say thank you for being here. Hope to see you in any of the learn sessions. And if you enjoyed it, feel free to share some feedback and look forward to see you again in any of the other modules. Take care for now and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for attending. See you next week. And thank you, Unai, as well for the cool demos and helping we with talking about this cool topic called Introduction to Git. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Unai.